It's no secret that people use politics as a way to organize their social worlds. There's plenty of behavioral science research showing that people sort themselves ideologically. Liberals living and working together, conservatives living and working together. More and more of our tastes and preferences are aligning with political orientations, and people are quick to suss out each other's political views. But this can make it tricky to navigate a bunch of social interactions. It seems like we feel at ease in the company of people we agree with politically, but nervous and distant in the company of the enemy, I mean the people we disagree with politically. The good news is that there are a bunch of social scientists studying how we have these kinds of interactions and how we can have better ones. I'm thinking of research by folks like Julia Minson, Guy Itchikoff, and Taylor Carlson, who, wouldn't you know it, have been guests on this very show. Sometimes, though, just knowing the science isn't enough. Sometimes we need concrete examples of how we can live in harmony with people who see the world differently. Well, luckily, there's a new podcast on the scene called A Braver Way, and it's a practical guide to disagreeing about politics without losing heart. Each episode features an example of a way in which disagreements can be challenging and interviews with people who know something about that challenge. Along the way, you kind of just pick up by osmosis this very hopeful sense that we can do this. Disagreement doesn't have to come with vitriol. We don't need to abandon our convictions, but we can take a minute to breathe before making assumptions about the people who don't share our opinions. You're listening to Opinion Science, the show about our opinions, where they come from, and what we do with them. This week, we'll hear from Monica Guzman. She's the host of that new podcast, A Braver Way, but that's only what she's up to these days. She began her career as a journalist, but like a lot of us, she grew concerned about what was going on in politics. And not just among politicians, but in how everyday people were treating politics, building up fences between themselves and the people they disagreed with. She eventually became the Senior Fellow for Public Practice at Braver Angels, which is a nonprofit with the mission to bring Americans together to bridge the partisan divide. And last year, she released her book, I Never Thought of It That Way, How to Have Fearlessly Curious Conversations in Dangerously Divided Times. I told her this before we started recording, but I started reading her book uh, to prep for the interview, and I didn't expect to get so swept up in it. <laughs> it's really well written and insightful, and you should definitely check it out. But her whole thing is championing these curious conversations, the kinds of conversations that can bring people together when they disagree without feelings getting hurt. So when I heard about the new podcast, I reached out to Monica and was excited to talk to her about it and the bigger picture of what she does. So let's get right into my conversation with Monica Guzman. I thought maybe as a way of of getting into the just general idea of having curious conversations, we could start with like, why would we want to do that? That was one of the, the thoughts that I kept having is like, as a persuasion researcher, so often when I hear about like, you know, uh, build, bridge building, it's like in the interest of getting through to the other side and making your points. And there the goal is quite clear, like is changing minds. But that doesn't, I don't get the sense that like, that's the fundamental point of curious conversations from your perspective. But then I was like, so, but then why would we do this? <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> to mm -hmm. you, like, what's the point? Like, why is this something that we ought to be thinking about? Yeah, I do find that this is a different set of answers for different people. Uh, for me personally, there have been so many times in my journalism career and on where people surprise me. And the, the delight in discovering something or in complicating something I thought I knew, it actually is delightful, even when it's annoying I end up being grateful because I learned something. Now, not everybody's like that. And for a lot of different people, like I said, there's lots of different reasons. I mean, you mentioned persuasion. Lots of people just want their view to gain more followers. And if you aren't bringing some level of openness and curiosity and humility, it's very unlikely, as you know from the persuasion science, that persuasion will actually work. And then there's also folks who care deeply about politics and political divides is what I focus on really, really deeply about certain issues. And a lot of folks have it in their heads that if they get curious and engage with their opponents, they're actually betraying their convictions. If they listen and stay open, they're actually undermining the cause. But it's just the opposite. 
Um, if you are an activist or an advocate for an issue, it is extremely easy and in fact pretty much a given that unless you actually talk with your opponents every now and then, leave some space and energy for that, you're going to base your tactics for fighting for your cause and all of that on projections of what the other side believes and why. So if you don't check your assumptions with reality by actually going to the primary source every now and then, which is people who actually believe these things, um, you're not going to be a very effective advocate. It, it seems to you that like it, it's in the interest of truth, right? Like if you care about yes. knowing something uh, yes. and you realize like, oh, maybe I'm mostly making assumptions. And, yeah. and so much of what I thought was just like my rational assessment of the world around me is actually mostly me filling in the gaps when I could actually go mm -hmm. out there and find out for real <laughs> where people are coming from. Exactly. And where I place this in the context of today, like the, the, the subtitle of my book is, you know, Dangerously Divided Times, How to Have Fearlessly Curious Conversations in Dangerously Divided Times. I, I really believe, I think there's a very, very strong case to make that we are all, no matter how educated or informed we think we are, by living in this world, very vulnerable to just a lot of misperception about the debates and what they're really about about people and why they actually believe what they believe. So we are all moving away from reality unless we have have more curious conversations across divides. Do, do you think people were more checked in like years and years ago, 40 years ago? Mm -hmm. Do you get the sense that like the public was a more mm, informed in a less biased way or I'm just curious what you think about like the trajectory yeah. over time. Like where are we now right. relative to where we were before? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to argue that, you know, in the past we were more informed. We're awash in information. We're always learning. You know, humanity has this lovely way of accumulating knowledge and sharing it. So it's it's complicated to say we were smarter in the past. Like, I don't know that's true. But what I do know is true, and researchers like Liliana Mason in particular have looked into this, is that we are more siloed. So the different the differences between us are really aligning, right? So that if you are a Democrat and a person of color and you are secular, you know, you're all those identities tend to stack one on top of the other more often than they used to. 40 years ago, there were more liberal Republicans, right? And conservative Democrats. Uh, and we also just had more, more mixing of, of in certain kinds of spaces uh, of different sorts of people. And so I think there was this organic web of difference that was just a little more entrenched. Um, now, of course, we have technology. We have the pandemic that got a lot of us to be really comfortable working from home. We have less serendipitous connections and fewer collisions in our daily lives where, with different kinds of people in the context of sort of in-person interaction where you can really see people's whole self and humanity and everything. And they're not just a walking opinion on Twitter. So all of these things, I think, combine to make this a particularly pernicious time for hacking our psychology, which as we know, a lot of the tech platforms are brilliant at. And I'll, I'll, I'll put myself in that bucket. I mean, I, I once wrote a blog for a Seattle news organization where my entire job was to get as many clicks as I could. And it was a trend following blog and I got really good at it. Really good. I could hop to the top of Google trends by knowing what words to put in my headline. So <laughs> is that, you know, it's, that's just kind of overwhelmed us quite a bit. And um, there's a lot of dopamine and a lot of pleasure to get from being surrounded by voices that affirm you. So we have to fight a little harder to make sure that we're not just in those pools and nothing else. I'm curious, the the uh, experience you have hacking the algorithm, so to speak, <laughs> uh, either a tech algorithm or like a psychological algorithm uh, is interesting. It, it reminds me of the work on trying to... Um, attack misinformation. And one of the interventions is like giving people the experience of saying the most outlandish mm -hmm. things that are going to attract people to their point, mm -hmm. even though they're not true. Um, and it's that experience where you go like, oh, this is actually easy. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, not hard at all. Yeah. And like, I can see those tricks when they come up. Uh, so I'm yeah. curious, like, is there anything else about your experience as a journalist that is informing the way you think about kind of the nature of these conversations today and, and how we can have them better? I mean, there's, there's a lot. I mentioned just the, the interviews that I, that I've had, how many times I came to a story, came to an interview, a subject, you know, you're just a subject looking for a quote 
I know what the story is. I just need a quote. But okay, my editor made me come over here and sit down with you. And then you listen to people and, oh my gosh, like the truth is so much more interesting and complicated and different than what I thought. And then I'm reminded of that obligation. I'm not here to be quick about it. I'm here to try to accurately and responsibly represent someone's story to their community so that the community can be informed about itself. Because how the heck are you going to have a healthy democratic society without that? So yes, I think that people understanding each other is an extraordinarily critical ingredient to a good, you know, what we call democracy. It's really, really important, but we, we don't name that ingredient hardly ever. People understanding each other, really important when there's so many differences and so many potential conflicts. I mean, I think of um, all the movies, you know, I've ever seen where so many times the, the problem is a misunderstanding. So many times the main conflict is that someone's not understood, right? So we know this. We know this about human nature. And the tragedy of that is, well, understanding is not that hard. It just requires a proximity that we usually want to avoid. So anyway, you know, pieces of, of my journalism um, have pointed to that. Another thing is just... Um, in journalism as well, there's, there's language, right? Journalists have this power that we don't often acknowledge to basically set the language uh, for which something is spoken about. Now, we used to have more of that power exclusively before social media and all those things came up. Now it's <laughs> sometimes social media makes the language and journalists either accept or reject. But because everything's moving so fast, it was interesting for me to, to acknowledge and experience as a journalist the power of my language. So I was a tech, uh, you know, columnist for a while. And I remember the phrase, you know, ride sharing platform, you know, Uber and, and all these places are ride sharing platforms. We're just sharing our rides. You guys, it's all we're doing. <laughs> we're just like me and my car. I could just share my ride. But, you know, when you looked at how the deep regulatory thing that was happening with taxi cabs and with regulation from cities and should they be regulated? Well, no, because it's just a ride-sharing platform. It's of the community. No, come on. <laughs> these platforms are making such a buck, right? So there's all these there's all these times where I've caught myself being like, oh, wow, I use that term. And I say that because in politics, my, my gosh, like different groups speak completely different languages. And one word or term, illegal immigrant, will set the left off, right? But white privilege will set the right off. And what is meant and can we understand and can we look behind the language? So this is another thing that I've become extremely conscientious of as a journalist is the power of language um, and how, how it can get in the way. The words can get in the way of human understanding. Yeah, especially if you if we go back to the idea that we make so many assumptions about other people, right? Some of that is just like we're not actually hearing this person say their whole thought. We're hearing like the words they're using to as a shorthand yes. for that thought. Right. And we go like, I get it, I get it, I get it. You mean that this is what uh, this is about? I mean, you know, for, for sure I, I get that as someone who teaches about things like prejudice and privilege, mm -hmm. like those are such loaded words where yeah. it's like, yeah, I, I know it sounds like what I'm saying is this, but it's not really what we mean when we talk about this, right? right. Um, and, and that's true across the board, right? Like there are these easy shorthand words that we have that can be misleading if you don't mm -hmm. dig further past just that word exactly. itself. Yeah, that's an interesting exactly. idea. Exactly. Yeah, and and it's um, it's often done unconsciously. We just pick up the words and the language of people around us. So here in Seattle, you know, things about abortion are reproductive rights. But go into a conservative community and reproductive rights does not get to what they think the issue is. Um, so, yeah, and we again, it's just unconscious. And so I think a lot of the things that curiosity, that hold curiosity back is, is what's unnoticed, is what we do without even noticing. And because we live in a media and information landscape that's just a barrage of information, we have very little time or invitation or incentive to reflect. We just react. What that means, I think, is that we're absorbing unconscious beliefs at a breakneck pace. You know what I mean? <laughs> and we don't, we don't even notice. Like, I'll, I'll look through my Instagram feed, right, for a minute, and then I'll put it down to do something else, and I'll be in a bad mood, and I don't know why. What the heck did I see that made me suddenly, I don't know, it's just, but it's in there now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Um, we all, I think a lot of us have that experience. So, so when we're, when we're faced with this challenge of a world where this is the dilemma of 
differences of perspective and assumptions that we make. I'm curious to, to dig in at just a little bit, at least, into like, w- what are some things that, that you would suggest people do to actually have these kinds of productive conversations with people that they would ordinarily write off? Right. Well, let's start with the simplest possible thing. Because a lot of folks say, I'm not ready to have a conversation. They'll often think about the hardest possible topic or the hardest possible person, which don't do that, first of all, right? You can have far easier conversations with someone who's a good friend and you just disagree on this one thing and you haven't brought it up. Well, you know, you could try that. But even before that, if even that seems scary, then when you are reading headlines, whether it's social media or anywhere else, and you come across a headline that represents a perspective that's popularly held, but something you really disagree with, and here's the practice. You open that article, and instead of reading it looking for ammo or affirmation, you read it asking yourself, what are the deep down honest concerns informing this perspective? And you also might ask yourself, what is the strongest argument for this side? How could I articulate the argument so that someone on this side would go, yes, exactly. So these are hard things to do, but at least you're only talking with yourself and with the article as a sort of artifact, right? Um, and so you practice curiosity just by asking yourself that question, like, hmm, you know, where where might this be coming from? And how could I express it generously? And your brain, by doing that exercise, will already start to notice the assumptions it might be making and the the, the, the gates, the barriers that it puts up toward understanding something that you frankly just don't want to understand. You're resisting it because you don't like it. We all do that. So I think that's a really essential step, um, especially on topics that you feel like, Mm-mm, there can be nothing good here. And I, m- maybe you're right. Okay, you know, we, we I don't know. <laughs> but but it's, um, it's really important to ask yourself, what am I missing? If there's a lot of people that are looking at things a different way, and they're my fellow citizens or whatever. Like, what am I missing? Can I, can I look at it through their eyes? Not so that I agree, but so that I understand. Um, and I become sort of a better citizen <laughs> and, and, and kind of co-conspirator in trying to build a society where we can all thrive. Um, so that's, that's one. And then I'll just mention one for you're actually in conversation. My favorite is instead of asking the question, why do you believe what you believe? Ask, how did you come to believe what you believe? And by that, I don't mean script it out and say those exact words. It's just, we often ask the question, why do you believe what you believe in various forms, right? Like, explain that. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but across a divide and with a lot of distrust, that that does make people feel guarded. Like, they don't just have to justify their position on that issue. They have to justify themselves. That That's what our toxically polarized environment has kind of made feel real. But when, when you instead ask questions that are more like, so what led you to that? Can you, can you tell me more about, you know, do, any personal experiences that impacted you on this? Do you know anyone impacted by this? Now you're talking. Now that person is sharing anecdotes, stories, not arguments. And this is good because you get to relate. And when you, when you relate, it's a lot harder for you to judge out of hand or sort of recklessly react, you know? To, to, to some emotion you have built up about an argument. And instead you're like, you're imagining being this person. Um, and that really changes things. And there's a lot of study in science about, about that and how, you know, hearing, for example, about somebody's moral beliefs in the form of personal stories, people end up respecting those a lot more than they would if they heard them as just like logical arguments. And, and again, I wanna, I wanna emphasize, if there's a lot of trust and not a lot of suspicion, Debate to your heart's content, <laughs> insult each other, have fun, banter, you know, it's great. It's really, really great. And boy, would I like to get back to a time in our culture where we can do that more, but not right now. You know, for a lot of people, not right now. For some relationships, totally, have at it. Um, but but you usually have to have a pretty strong relationship um, and enough practice disagreeing civilly, frankly. It's reminding me. I don't want to jump the gun too much, but we, I promise we'll come to the new podcast in a little bit. But I, it, I couldn't help but recall the moment about uh, Lincoln and Douglas and this like pattern of debate. Obviously, like they had a professional relationship built on debate, and yet, like there are these moments of humanity where it was so obvious that like, oh. Lincoln couldn't find a place to put his hat, and Douglas was like, "Oh yeah, I'll hold on to it. Like, what's the big deal?" Can you like, <laughs> 
we're oh. both we're both living in this world trying to do the best that we can. And that yeah. was a very powerful moment to be like, oh yeah, like you can have diametrically opposed ideas about what the right answer to a question is yeah. and still recognize each other's humanity. Yeah, I absolutely love that story. And Ron C. White, who's the leading Lincoln scholar that we interviewed for that episode, he he like got pretty emotional talking about that story. And um, because I, I think he sees the power of it too. T today, we just imagine that if you are bitter rivals in politics, you can't possibly, you can't possibly want to be even close to each other. And unfortunately, recently, we've had, you know, pretty bad models uh, of that. So just the idea of sitting, you know, at an inauguration where the man who defeated you is giving his inaugural address and he's got his address and he's got his hat and he's got his cane and needs to put things down. And so you go, I've got that, sir. You can hand that to me. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, what? But I will say, I mean, I, having um, taken a deep dive into Lincoln, you know, for that episode and, and beyond, like, boy, did we luck out with that man at that time. <sighs> boy. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and the other thing, it, it, just, it just feels so foreign to the politics that we have right now. And, and in a way we're... You know, you hear stories about like, oh, behind the scenes, like, as, you know, not too long ago, there was plenty of people that are just like, well, our kids go to the same school. Like, it doesn't yeah. really matter what the label on my pin says. Like, we're still working in the same building and like we can figure out yeah. a way to get along. It just seems like we've it, we put that on display so much. Yeah. And there's like this kind of like, <laughs> like Jerry Springer audience vibe yeah. to the whole like political uh, system. That it's just like, oh, like, they're just playing to the room, kind of, yeah, by, like, yeah. being mean to each other. Yeah, absolutely. And it makes me think of, you know, something else that's really changed is even back in the era of, you know, TV, like, it was all TV, where the cameras were on, right? Politicians have to perform. They do. They have to perform. They are symbols in a lot of ways, and people expect something of them. So they perform. They perform their debates. They perform their beliefs. All right, fine. But then the cameras are off, and then they live their lives, and then they talk to their colleagues across the aisle, and everything's fine. In the social media era, you know, being on camera is now all the effing time. And so the performance feels like it has to be all the time. And that's really too bad. Now, I, I will say a hopeful note. A couple weeks ago, I was at a conference where Michelle Obama was speaking. And she was talking about, there's sort of a famous friendship that's developed between her and George W. Bush. And uh, she was saying that, frankly, the reason that happened, and, and this is funny, is because again, it's about proximity we tend to avoid, is that in a lot of uh, official events where formers come, former presidents and their wives or, you know, um, partners, uh, they they have to sit in a certain order. It's like the former president and, and, and that first lady and then the next former. So that means that Michelle Obama and George W. Bush are always next to each other. And so she said, really, it started with that. You know, we would just, we'd be at a funeral. We'd be at some ceremonial thing. And, and like, hi, how you doing? You know, and he's just got such good humor. And so that's where it started. And I love that idea of sort of a ritualistic ceremony where you have to have, you know, the president and wife next to the former president and wife was what, what developed that. It reminds me, there's this, this old study from back in the fifties in social psychology, uh, where they looked at like who becomes friends in a dorm building on campus. Mm -hmm. And it's like, one of the best predictors is how far away are your dorm rooms from each other? Exactly. Uh, it's just it's a simple proximity simple. effect, right? Like, <laughs> well, you like each other is. more if you see each other more. Uh, That's it. Yeah, yeah. And it's it, just it, that simple. Similarly, um, on this show, and this is now a couple of years ago, I was talking to someone who did this analysis in India of this um, slum relocation project where they sort of built these apartment buildings and brought people together who had been living elsewhere. And it was a random lottery, like where you end up in this place. And it was a, they, she was able to find that like it helped address intercaste prejudices based mm. on just like I random, my neighbor now randomly, or like the people on my floor now randomly are from a different group as me. And suddenly I go like, oh yeah, like all those things that I've been told about what it means to be part of this cast or that cast. Like, I'm just not seeing it really <laughs> when I actually am here sitting next to this person. And so, you know, by to bring it back to, to the stuff that you do, like getting people to talk, maybe like as simple as being like, you're just here together. A and it might not even be about what you're talking about. Just the fact that you're like, oh yeah, you're a person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and exactly. I can only recognize that by actually having this interpersonal interaction. Exactly. We've recognized that at Braver Angels. So this is a nonprofit that, um, 
that I'm at and we work on all kinds of program skills building exercises, but, but about bridging the political divide. And a colleague of mine made this observation that a lot of times when we have our uh, Braver Angels debates, which we don't declare a winner, we just have a structure where two sides can really hear each other really well. Um, what we've, what we've noticed is that just their being together at all, like not even opening their mouths definitely has an effect. It's already powerful. It's like, and I can attest to this. I mean, just being in the presence of someone you know disagrees, I think is already powerful. Um, in the in the sort of generous presence where you're not in a fight, you just know that they're over there and you're here. You're you're here. You're here. Oh my gosh, right? And I have <laughs> I start having a conversation with myself, like, what do they believe? Oh my gosh, you know, what are they eating? Like, what are they doing? And then, oh hi, you know. And it's just, I think a lot of times we think that everything has to be an argument. And it's because we forget that simple principle that just being in each other's presence has a humanizing effect. That's it. And we can have those conversations just as like small talk, right? Like uh, that, that idea that, that we expect everything to be an argument does seem to be a little yeah. bit of a product of social media where it's like, Absolutely. ooh, man, those things blow up and we see those. And That's then right. it feels like, oh, God, if I have an opinion on this, the only way this can go is for it to become a fight. That's um, right. And that's because presence is 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 blank on the internet. Like being together doesn't have a feeling. And so you have to say something. Then it becomes real. Then you've manifested some evidence of your presence at all. But that's not the way it works in real life, you know? And we have that. I, I'm curious. I, I get the sense that through, so through Braver Angels, you facilitate these kinds of conversations between people or like workshops and things like that. So like you're hosting these kinds of interactions live, right? So you're seeing, you've seen them play out plenty is mostly oh, yes. what I'm getting at. Okay. Many times. Uh, yes. So like, I'm just curious to kind of get your take on like the themes behind these kinds of conversations for people who are new to them or apprehensive about them. Like what are the things that people maybe struggle most with in the kind of learning phase of knowing how to do this? What are the kinds of things that people can do more easily than they expect to be able to do? just sort of curious, like when you see these play out, like what are you seeing that is either consistent or inconsistent with what people expect out of these mm. conversations? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm thinking about the Braver Angels debates I've been a part of, but also the the many workshops that I've observed or, you know, helped with. Um, I mean, what one of the big things is people do tend to assume that the other side has no good points. And when they hear someone else articulate their point of view. And it's just a human. We don't tend to have a lot of like experts or, you know, heads of advocacy organizations every now and then, but it's just regular people who are like, here's what I believe. I, I remember um, the very first debate that I saw was in April of 2020, and it was about the lockdowns and whether they should end because it's affecting livelihoods. And living in Seattle, I was very awash, of course, and like, you know, more of the left way of looking at it, which is like, lock it down. There's no <laughs> question, like lives, rives. But we didn't think about livelihoods as much because, hey, we're like working on Zoom and our computers. What's the problem? Uh, <laughs> and so in that in that conversation, I heard folks from all over, from the Midwest, you know, all over all over the place talking about how afraid they were for their livelihoods and and their businesses. And they don't know what to do when they're, you, they, they can't lean on their communities anymore in the way they could. And Oh my gosh, it was so impactful for me. So this has happened over and over and over again, and I see it from, from other people too. Recently, we did a pair of debates, re-elect Donald Trump and re-elect Joe Biden. And I was sitting there, you know, because I'm liberal, I was sitting there in the re-elect Donald Trump like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, even though I've done this work for a long time and I have parents who voted for Donald Trump and I understand their reasons, they're still very much of like, all right, see what you got. And I have to say, like, you know, I don't know. It, life is so complicated. And I did. I heard, I heard a lot of really good points. And so it's, it's, difficult to, it's difficult to say that something was a good point. But honestly, here's what I think. I think that when you witness somebody saying something that makes sense, whether you admit it or not, in your own mind, you know it makes sense. You know. You know. You don't have to admit it if you're not ready right? But it does add up. And so I think people have, have that experience. Uh, one of the things that happens after a lot of workshops, so at the end of our workshops, we often ask people, how, how did it go? What's something you learned? We have a lot of people who say something to the effect of from both sides. I can't believe how much media has made me believe these things that aren't true. 
that that it, I, I can't think of a single workshop where I haven't observed that being at least like 30 to 40 percent of the comments, you know, where people go, oh, I hadn't, <laughs> hadn't thought to actually talk to people, you know, um, and and so that I, I've become kind of addicted to that. I think a lot of the people who do a lot of Brave Angels things have become addicted to that, where there's a there's a source of information that is media and we need it because hell we can't we can't go around understanding everything all the time and we need trustworthy media and there's some that's more trustworthy than others than others and we know that um but there's a really useful font of information which is just daily dialogue you know among different people in a diverse democracy that's just important it's actually critical and um we forget that or we've we've just taken it for granted for a long time back when it was a lot more organic one of the things you said about how uh, this uh, surprise is that the other side has something reasonable to say reminds me of something I noticed in your book, which is basically that that idea, right? That uh, that we expect people who think differently from us to have no good reason to think that way, and then we're surprised to find out, like lo and behold, like most of the time they do. I did have a reaction though, where I was like, yeah, but sometimes they don't, right? Yeah. Like. <laughs> Sometimes you ask people, you know, what's going on, and they really can't say anything, right? Because they just sort of like heard a catchphrase and are parroting it. Yep. But as I thought about it, I was like, that is more reason to have these conversations. Yes. And approach them from the perspective of curiosity. For this show, I talked to Guy Itchikoff and some of his work looks at how being a good listener can just be the thing that helps people sort out their own opinion for themselves. Um and so by giving people the benefit of the doubt and being like, let's assume you do have a good reason for this, that actually might be a great service to you to go like, okay, well, I guess in this case I was right. <laughs> yeah. But also yeah. for the other person to like have that opportunity to engage critically and not be written off as someone who couldn't possibly have any good reasons, like that's a service to, to yeah. give people the benefit of the doubt. I think so. And, and I'll, I'll say this too. I think that when people are confronted with the unreasonableness of something they believe, what we tend to do is turn the knife. <laughs> Aha, see, see, yeah, it yeah. doesn't make any sense. right? And the more that we do that, the more that those people, instead of being in a humble place where they're like, you know, I think I was wrong about this. They're going to be like, screw you, you know, there's this and this, and they'll just reach for more reasons and they'll back away and they'll be gone. And they're going to want to believe that thing that, that maybe you pointed out might not be right. Just to spite you and all the people like you, you know, I think we do that to each other all the time. Um, so there's still, even if you, even if you really do think you're right, the conversation about how right you are is just not a useful one past a certain point. So I saw this video on TikTok not too long ago where, you know, it was one of those series where like you put a mic in front of people, see what they say. And then, and, uh, this was sort of a liberal leaning, leaning thing. And so they put a mic in front of a person, uh, who was more conservative on, on gun things. And the person was saying that more people are, what was it? Something like more people are killed by hammers than guns. No, really, they really, really are. And so, you know, the, the guy with the mic was listening a little bit and then he goes, well, you know, let's look it up. And so he looks it up. How many people were killed by hammers? A lot less than people who were killed by guns. And the, the last line of the video, and the video was a bit mocking, right? The last line of the video turns back to that, to that person and he goes, but I'm still, but I'm still worried. I'm still worried that we're overreacting on guns. And I thought that was so interesting because what we tend to do is say, aha, I caught you in misinformation. You're lying about this. You were wrong about this. And then, and then as if to say, so you're wrong about everything. So your point of view has no validity at all. But like that last line, the man was like, but I'm still concerned, you know? So, so our concerns, I think, guide a lot of times the data points that we want to glom onto, you know, or make us vulnerable to believing things that aren't really believable, but it's because they've addressed our concern. And so what really needs to be heard is the concern. The concern is true. The concern is real. Talk about the concern. Because if you don't, people will continue to feel unheard, 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 and they're going to just, you know, we're all going to spiral away from each other toward whatever. I mean, this is a complicated world. You know, like I grew up Catholic. I remember my my mom, you know, just making the point that like you can pull anything out of the Bible to argue anything at all. It's a big book. You know? <laughs> it's it's really really big and complicated. So um, the same with our world. It's like you know we we lord facts over each other, but it's like it's a complicated world. Listen to the concerns. The, that's what's leading people to want to grab onto certain facts or believe facts that aren't real. 
I have a lot of ambivalence about these gotcha videos that you're talking about, and yeah. uh, I'm a real sucker for them, and TikTok has learned this, because there is like, you know, there's a quiet vindication of being like, see, they don't know what they're talking about. But I, they also sort of terrify me, because I am I do think like, if someone caught me in the same sort of situation and pressed me really hard on something that I actually think is probably true and valid, I might f- flounder in that moment. I might not be able to perfectly articulate uh, where that comes from. And rather than treat it as an opportunity, which is what you could do to be like, oh, maybe this is like, a, like I said before, like something that, oh, now I can sort of sit in this and, and really make sure that I understand like, well, if it's not coming from here, where is this value of mine coming from? Uh, but instead we throw it up as a 10 second video and go like, ah, <laughs> look at these Look crazy at these people. silly, yeah. yeah and and be- everybody's doing it. Yeah. It's so popular. And going back to my journalism days, that shit sells, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's complete, it's complete garbage. The assumptions in it are complete garbage. If you catch someone in a wrong fact or you can get them in a gotcha, you don't have to listen to them anymore. What? What? What is that? You know, as if it's all about just, you know, whack-a-mole. Well, yeah, it's whack-a-mole with arguments, right? <laughs> but it's like, not, you don't make any progress unless you listen to the meaning underneath. Um, and we have to do that. One thing I, I want to mention, too, that I know that you've talked about before is a question that's come up as I think about the power or need for these kinds of conversations, which is, are they always the best thing to do? I, I remember talking to a friend once about this kind of work that I was doing on interactions, and I was kind of pitching this as like, isn't it always the best to like approach with curiosity and learning everything? And she was kind of like, yeah, but like, do you always owe it to everyone to like respect their views? And are there times where you'd go like, if you're being oppressed by someone, it, do you really, is it your responsibility to approach that person and say like, with compassion, like, let's have this uh, conversation. So, so I'm just curious, like, what does that mean to you? How do you navigate this? Like, yeah. when are these conversations, are they always called for, or maybe are they not necessarily yeah. that? Yeah. Well, I, I like that you use the word responsibility. Am I responsible for? And responsible, you know, formally, what that means is how do I respond? Is it on me to respond? How do I respond? I, I really do think that, you know, any attempts to make a universal prescription on this are just flawed. Uh, there is no such thing. There, there's no universal script. And no, I don't think that we have, we all have the obligation at all times to approach all conversations in the same way. Um, and there's, there's a lot that, that speaks to that. I mean, sometimes if, if you're not, if you are really, really scared, you know, and you feel a sense of threat, just approaching a person who believes a certain thing, that's not going to be a great conversation. Like fear is, Fear is powerful and, um, you know, definitely kind of antagonistic to curiosity because you can't wonder about something you think is out to get you. You know, what I will say is that it can be easy to conflate, you know, discomfort and danger. And so I think it's really important for us to not stop trying to discern the difference between danger and discomfort. Um, but but there are people who who will say, you know, it, I, I am always being harmed, uh, you know, because of who I am in a conversation with a certain person about a certain thing. That's just going to be harmful for me every single time. And, you know, OK, like, like, great on that issue. Great. But I'll bet there's another issue where that's not the case. And people are more than an opinion on one thing. So is it possible to still perhaps, I don't know, bake cookies at the school bake sale with this person? Is it still possible to, I don't know, like whatever, just be at the baseball game with this person and share your popcorn? Is is it possible? Now, you may not want to, and that's okay. I remember, um, oh, this guy named Chris Singleton, who's really extraordinary. His mother was killed in the, um, uh, the, the massacre at um, Emmanuel Church, you know, where nine people were killed by like a white supremacist. It was awful. And um, he kind of became famous very quickly because he forgave that killer really soon. So he goes around and, and talks about forgiveness and these things. And he was he was saying that, you know, he, he bought a house. He lives in the South somewhere. He bought a house and there's a neighbor of his and got a chance to go and like check out this neighbor. And he's black. Um, and his neighbor's white 
And his neighbor's going around his house showing him things. And he points to like this chandelier and he goes, oh yeah, like this was the, this was the slave owner's chandelier. You know, and, and like Chris could tell this guy had some views that not great. And so Chris, Chris told, told the crowd, you know, he said like, I can love him, but I can love him from a distance. One of the things I really love in the book uh, is this idea that we don't choose our opinions. And so I just kind of want to open that up to explore a little bit and what that means. It reminds me a little bit, I don't know if you know, Pete Holmes is a comedian and he has a podcast. And one of the things that, that I don't know why, <laughs> keeps coming up on his show is this saying he has of, if I were you, I'd be you. And it's that idea that like, yeah, like we yeah. might disagree, but if I were you, I'd be you. Like yes. you are you because you've done all the things you've done and I'm yes. not that person. And I kind of need to acknowledge like, oh, you yeah. arrived at this through the same process by which I arrived at who I am today. And it kind of reminded me of this idea. We don't choose our opinions. Our, our opinions are a natural product of our experiences, thoughts, and beliefs. And so what does that mean to you? And what does that mean about how we get along with each other? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you were saying that, I was reminded of there's a line in the introduction to the book that I almost didn't write, um, even though it's true and kind of profound. But but I talked about my parents, you know, who voted for Trump and, and me who didn't in our conversations. And I said, you know, what I learned from our conversation was if I were them, I would have voted for Trump, too. And it's that exact same principle. If I were them, I would have been them. And now that I know the path they have walked to their views, well... Yeah, <laughs> like it just it it adds up. What we do adds up. You know, we 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 look at each other like we're equations that don't make sense, but we are all equations that make sense. The question is whether we see all the variables. That's it. <laughs> it's literally it. So so yeah, what I think it means for how we talk about our opinions is we can't go around thinking that. I can just mic drop some meme onto social media. And because it had a great impact on me in that I saw it and I was like, yes, this is exactly the reason that I believe what I believe. This meme, and it's so clever and beautiful. And so I'm going to hand this reason to somebody else, you know, whether it's a meme or just a point made in conversation. I'm going to hand this reason to someone else and I'm going to expect that they're going to see its brilliance and that everything that, that they have in them is going to change to fit the way... The way I feel like it fits me. And it's so crazy. That's so <laughs> ridiculous that we do that. Because what we, we do that because we think we're all the same. We're the same container. And an opinion should have the same effect. A reason should have the same effect on all of us. It does not. Stop it. It does not. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> it's, it's like we, for, we just forget that we are completely different shapes of containers. And some reason is going to just mean nothing. Some reason is going to offend the other person that you really loved. They're going to throw it across the room. They're not going to want it. Um, and yet we, we have these expectations of each other. And, and when other people don't meet our expectations, the way they receive our opinions, well, then they must be crazy, stupid, or evil. Humph. Um, and that's that. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the new show. Uh, a Braver Way, right? Is that what mm -hmm. it's called? Um, it's called A Braver Way. A Braver Way. Great. Uh, so let me just throw it to you. Like, w w what is this thing? And, and, and really maybe as a story opportunity, like why is it existing in the world now? <laughs> Where did this come from? Why are you doing this? Oh man. Well, I've been doing work of bridging across the political divide for some time. I've been learning lots of stories, meeting lots of people who've suffered through it, who've made transformations in their own lives or communities by trying stuff, you know, learned a lot along the way. And I've also just gathered and I'm still gathering the skills that we need or the mindsets that we need to be able to do it, right? So it feels like the big question hanging over so many people right now is how, how, you know, how could I maybe sort of repair a relationship that's broken because of politics? How could I disagree productively with someone who believes something I think is just awful, but I still want to engage? Like, how do I engage when there's like a whole legacy of pain over, over a long period of time? There's all these how, 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 how. And so this podcast is, is that. It is reflecting and, and trying to offer something into that question. How? So it's not, it's not trying to be an intellectual thing. Uh, you know, we're, we're not trying to just bring like authors just because they wrote books on it. We, we have interviews with people who have demonstrated courage in crossing the divide. And the interviews are focused on what, what can we learn from 
what you have done that could help all of us, all us listeners in our own journeys. So that, yeah, and it came about because I just think this is the question that really needs answering for a lot of people. And again, not from a sense of just the experts, you know? No, I think that what I've learned is that people have this wisdom. This is not an intelligence book learning type of thing. You don't need to be a rocket scientist. You don't need to be a sociologist. Just be a good human. Is most, is the short answer is be a good human. Okay, but what does that mean? What does that look like in these difficult situations? Well, let's talk about that, you know? And so everyone has access to being a good human. So some really surprising people you've never heard of have extraordinary stories um, that, that I think need to be elevated. So that's what the show's out to do. Nice. So by the time this comes out, I think the way it'll work is that the first three of yours will be out uh, at that point. And so without spoiling anything, you can tell us what those three are about. So like, could you give us a taste of like, what are the kinds of people that you talk to in this series? Yeah, yeah. Well, the second episode is one that comes to mind immediately. And uh, these are two friends, one white, one black, who discovered 10 years into their friendship that the family of the white man once owned the family of the black man as slaves. If you can imagine that moment in their friendship. Um, and they're both Christian conservatives. And the way that they have navigated this relationship, this revelation, and also what they feel it calls them into, you know, like they talk about God and they talk about the dreams and they talk about racial justice from the right, which for me on the left, I remember I was reading their book and I caught myself in an assumption. And my assumption was people on the right can't be good at racial justice. <laughs> and, you know, halfway through the book, which is brilliant, I was like, where the heck did that idea come from? Let me let that go right now. So you'll also see me as a host <laughs> go through some journeys. Uh, so, yeah, that that episode's really powerful. Um, there's another one where... Drum roll, please. I talked to my parents. And that one, that one's pretty dang candid. I, I learned things, you know, but but just trying to elevate a, a case study of a real family. And sure, let's make it mine. Um, so that one, you hear my mom talk about the pain that she felt when I told her as a teenager that I was pro-choice. Um, how extraordinarily difficult that was for her to accept. Because as far as she could tell, like, I believe something so morally repugnant. Um, so yeah, you, you just, we go, we go there. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Is the structure always the same? So, so I mentioned before that the one I listened to was on the, the interview with the Lincoln scholar and it was followed up by a conversation between you and April me. Lawson. Yeah. Yes. Who is um, my colleague at Braver Angels and the creator of Braver Angels debates. She's mm. genius. And she's also conservative and I'm liberal. I found that a really handy part of the structure of like kind of deconstructing part one <laughs> In part two, in a way that sort of models the kinds of things that you're talking about, right? Like kind of respectful disagreement about different kinds of things. Is that a feature? Is that kind of like structurally how the show is set up? That is structurally okay. how the show is set up. I think there's two episodes where we're not doing that because the interviews just need to be like longer and deeper and there's more kind of segmentation and narrative flow. Um, but but just about all the episodes, she's there. And we ask ourselves, we ask each other, uh, what do we think our side is good at and bad at when it comes to these strategies that came up in this episode. So she talks about the red side. I talk about the blue side and it's really interesting. Uh, like we've, woo, <laughs> like we stop recording those segments and we're like, whoa, <laughs> what did we even unearth here? Uh, and then each episode also, this is in some way, in some ways my favorite part, but I don't know. I have a lot of favorite parts, but we also have this um, interview that we do with some, somebody out there who has, transform something about themselves or their relationships or their communities for the better because they bridge the political divide. And so that that is sourced through an hour, hour and a half interview with this person. But then we edit it down to like five minutes of them telling the story in their own voice. And um, yeah, I mean, those are, hmm, there's a couple of those <laughs> that it's hard to listen to without really, really feeling it. So yeah, so that that's in every episode too. I'm I'm curious where you're finding the the subject matter to explore in each one. Seems like you I mean you've covered already and just like the few things that we've talked about like a pretty wide variety of things. And so I'm just curious like how, how do you approach producing a show like this? Yeah, well, it's been in the works for a while conceptually um before, you know, I fundraised a little bit and made it possible to produce. And um really what I wanted to do was have each episode answer a how question. So each episode has what we call a driving question. 
how do you cross the class divide? How do you bridge over a legacy of pain? Um, how do you disagree better in when you're an elected official? There's a fun episode on that. Um, or a community advocate. So each one, each one is that. And so we've, we've tried to pick how questions that are deeply relevant and then looked for the best guest, you know? Um, so yeah. So if, if there, if there's a really great guest, like, oh, it's a great idea, but there isn't really a how question that, that they have bridged the divide on, you know, that they can really inform, then it's not a fit. Um, yeah, so that makes it challenging. We still have, we have such a giant, like 150 people, right? 150 ideas, but but like 10 episodes this season, just the 10. Well, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to listening to the rest of them and just want to say thanks so much for taking the time to talk about all this. Yeah, thank you so much for the invite to do it. This was a great conversation. Alrighty, that'll do it for another episode of Opinion Science. Big thank you to Monica Guzman for taking the time to talk. Once again, you should check out her book, I Never Thought of It That Way, How to Have Fearlessly Curious Conversations in Dangerously Divided Times. And her new podcast is called A Braver Way. It launched a couple weeks ago with the first three episodes. And if you're listening to this on the day it comes out, the next Braver Way episode comes out tomorrow. I've listened to all three that have come out so far, and I really enjoyed them, especially the one where she talks with her parents. It's so good. Okay, but while you're listening to Monica's new show, don't you dare forget about this one. <laughs> Make sure you're subscribed to Opinion Science on all the podcast places. Hop onto Apple Podcasts or wherever to leave a nice review of the show and go to opinionsciencepodcast.com for all the past episodes and other goodies. That's all for now, I think. So thanks for being here and I'll see you in a couple weeks for more Opinion Science. Bye-bye. 